Yeah, welcome to the part five of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium, as known as ICU Link. I'm Sungun Lee from ICU. Uh, the topic of ICU Link this season is African linguistics. Today we have uh, a talk by Dr. Lee Bigmo from University of Albany. Let me introduce uh, Lee. Uh, Lee is a professor of linguistic anthropology and phonology at the University of Albany, a state university of New York. His research focuses on linguistic prosody, uh, tonal, accentual, and metrical phenomena. Uh, he works on uh, main, he mainly works on Bantu languages of Tanzania, Kenya, and Zambia, but uh, also has interest in Polynesian languages, uh, in particular Tahitian. Uh, he also emphasizes or like uh, <laughs> thinks it's important that uh, data collected uh, uh, in the field is being used for his research rather than necessary secondary uh, sources. Personally, I met Lee at probably some ACL conferences a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I was thinking and like Lee was the external committee member of my dissertation. So uh, it was very, uh, thank you one more time. <laughs> And uh, of course, our paths crossed multiple years, uh, uh, multiple times uh, over the year. It's good to have you at the ICU Linguistic Colloquium today. And Lee will talk about issues in Bantu melodic tone assignment and realization. Yeah. Thank you the very post. much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you. Um, thanks to ICU for um, doing this colloquium series and for inviting me to speak today. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen hopefully everything will go well here can everybody see that okay yes okay so um today um uh, i'm going to talk a little bit about issues in bantu melodic tone assignment and realization um since it's a talk about um tone i'd like to begin by sharing with you two of my favorite quotes about tone. The first one is about tone in general, and the second one is um, about tone in Bantu. So the first quote is from uh, Larry Hyman in his, from his paper, Tone, Is It Different? Tone systems have properties which surpass segmental and metrical systems. I conclude that tone can do everything segmental and metrical phonology can do, but that the reverse is not true. Since some tonal phenomena have no segmental or stress analogs, anyone who is interested in the outer limits of what is possible in phonology would thus be well served to understand how tone systems work. So I think this is part of the reason that, you know, even when it becomes complicated and fierce, that we try to stick to it because we know that tone can, you know, show us a lot of interesting things about language. Second quote is about, is from um, uh, Kissaberth and Odin. 2003, the close examination of Bantu tonal systems reveals patterns of extraordinary complexity. There are few other phono phonological phenomena as complex as Bantu tone. As a result, the importance of Bantu tone systems for the theoretical study of phonology cannot be overestimated. Okay. So with those kind of interesting um, big statements about tone, um, let me kind of set the stage for what I want to do here today. So I want to talk about melodic tones in, in Bantu, but before I do that, let me just remind all of us kind of what uh, melodic tones are. So you can draw a basic distinction in, in, in language, tone languages between lexical and grammatical tones. So the lexical ones I think are a little bit easier to conceive of. You know, we kind of think of this with the five different tones on the Chinese ma's, for instance, where there's a morpheme that's kind of underlyingly linked to some tone. So for instance, in, in Bantu language, many Bantu languages, bisyllabic nouns, for instance, in a two-tone language will, will illustrate all four, exhibit all four possibilities of you know, low, 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 high, high, low, and, and, and high, high. Um, adjectives in Chilungu um, uh, work this way. Um, verbs are a little simpler in that uh, no matter how long they are, they usually just come in two varieties either a toneless, var toneless variety and say a high tone variety. Okay, so those are lexical tones. So that's what, I, what I'm not talking about today, but it's one kind of tone and it's an, 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 an important type. But the other type of tone are, are tones are grammatical tones. And somehow, you know, this, 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 this moniker of melodic tones um, kind of became popular within Bantu. So I'm going to refer to them as melodic tones, but basically they're grammatical tones. They're sometimes also known as inflectional tones or affixal tones. So here, these are tones, most commonly high, but, but sometimes low, that are added to a word, most commonly a verb, but sometimes nouns, um, as an exponent, 
sometimes along with other segmental affixes of the expression of some inflectional property or cluster of inflectional properties. So for instance, the tense aspect, mood, polarity, clause type. Okay, so if this definition seems a little murky, fair enough. I think the best way to get people to understand kind of melodic tones are to just present an example. So let me turn to Chilungu, uh, which is you're gonna hear a lot about today, um, a Zambian Bantu language. And um, the verbal morphology of Chilungu is given to you there in five. It's typical of a Bantu language, uh, sub subject marker, tense aspect markers, then you know an ob uh, uh, optional um, object marker, and then you hit the stem, which is the verb root followed by extensions and a final vowel. A little bit of a simplified kind of um, a linear kind of um, uh, delineation there, but that gives you an idea of the morphology. Okay, so if we turn to Chilungu, every kind of finite conjugated Chilungu verb can be put in one of four baskets. They come in four flavors. So the first one is the easiest one, and that's when there's no melodic high tone at all. So if you take a look at the form in 6a, you can see the underlying representation here on the right. You have a high tone on the subject marker, and that's the only high tone. That's a lexical high tone. And th there's no other tone that's added. Basically, that accounts for the tone pattern that you see here with the small proviso that there's a super productive rule of tone doubling in the language. So this is the underlying high tone, and it's going to double over one and that's it. The rest of it turns out to be low tone. Okay, so that's a case where everything's sweet and simple, and if the whole language was like that, my monograph would have been a quarter of the size, but there's other cases, many other cases, where things get more complicated. So let's turn to the example in B. So here, um, we have a form with a high tone prefix a, ah, high tone prefix chi. Now that high tone is going to double onto the mu, fair enough, so that's how we get that. But note that we have an extra high tone in the stem here. So there's a high tone, and I've underlined it, that it needs to get associated to the second mora of the stem. And then, of course, it's going to spread over one via this tone doubling rule. So when you want to describe the recent past in Chilungu, it's actually not enough to just say, to do the recent past, have the high tone a prefix, the high tone chi prefix, put on the ile suffix, and that's it. No, you have to then say, but throw in an extra high tone. But it's not actually enough to just say throw in an extra high tone, because you have to you have to know where to put the high tone. And here it goes on the second tone bearing unit of the stem. Well, fine, you say that probably is true for all the verbs in the language. No. So if we go on to C here, here's a, a potential form. We have a high tone prefix nga, but now the high tone that gets thrown into the stem doesn't land on the second tone bearing unit of the stem, lands on the final one. So the high tone that you throw in this melodic high for the recent past, somehow you've got to direct it to the second tone bearing unit of the, of the stem. In the potential, somehow you got to ensure that it lands on the final tone bearing unit of the stem. And then the fourth kind of verb are those where the melodic high has to land on every tone bearing unit from the second through the final. Okay, so every verb in the language is characterized in one of those four ways, either no melodic high tone, or one that docks onto the second mora, or a melodic high that docks onto the final mora, or a melodic high that docks onto the second through the final. Now, we've known about melodic tones in Bantu for a long time. So even before it was necessarily called that, Excellent, you know, um, Bantuists um, like Meusin and Guthrie and, and, and others, when they described the verbal system, they successfully described the tones that were part of the verb. Okay. Their analysis might not look like, you know, what we would do today. And they gave it different names, but, but we've been describing these melodic tones for a long time. And so there's lots of good information, lots of good papers and grammars in the literature that do an outstanding job of describing. Um, the melodic um, tone patterns in Bantu languages. What is less common, okay, what is not studied as much, is trying to pin down exactly how this happens. Where is the melodic, where are these melodic highs introduced, and where are they docked, and what are the factors that determine that? So, at the end of their presentation of melodic tones in Chichewa, Downing and Mtenje in their outstanding monograph on the language asked the question that I want to examine here, which is 
where in the grammar are the, are the grammatical tones, are the grammatical tone patterns represented? And the response is very interesting. So if you look at the response, and I quote it here, this issue has surprisingly received no attention in the literature on Bantu morpho syntax, as far as we know, and relatively little attention in the phonology literature analyzing grammatical tone patterns. They go on, as, as we can see, the answer to this question is not obvious, since a combination of factors can determine the choice of tone. So my goal here today is when Laura writes her next grammar, in 2027 publishes her next grammar that when she comes to answer this question, she can hopefully say, oh, in the last 10 years, actually there's been progress on determining exactly where this happens in the grammar. I'm not gonna answer you know, all the questions today, but I hope to kind of um, maybe clarify what some of the more popular options and assumptions are, and then get us to kind of consider what the advantages and disadvantages of different approaches might be. So it's taking some initial steps. All right, innate questions that are critical to assessing how melodic tones function in the grammar. Um, are melodic high tones present in the input, um, the, the underlying representation, or are they inserted by some morphophonological rule? Um, if they're underlying, for instance, um, a floating tone suffix placed just before the final vowel, as many people have assumed, by what rule or constraint in the phonology will the melodic high in Chilungu, for instance, sometimes link to the second mora, sometimes link to the final mora, sometimes link to the second through the final? How much morphosyntactic information will the, phonolo um, will the phonology need access to in order to correctly dock those melodic tones? And what information does the morphology need just to generate the melodic tones in the first place? Is this information purely morphosyntactic or is some phonological information also sometimes necessary? So I can kind of phrase this another way in, in, in nine. Um, both morphosyntactic and phonological factors are definitely at play in the realization of melodic tones in Bantu. That's indisputable. No one questions that. Um, assuming, though, a model where morphosyntax proceeds and feeds a phonology component, is it possible that the generation of melodic tones is done solely on the basis of morphosyntactic factors and that the docking and linking of these tones is done in the, phon in the phonology component purely on the basis of phonology fa phonological factors? Or does the generation of the melodic tones in the morphology sometimes have to ha access morphological information? And does the docking or linking of the tones in the phonology sometimes have to be sensitive to morphosyntactic factors? These are the big questions that I want to kind of talk about today. So in that regard, let me present to you three different hypotheses as to how this might work. I'm not saying that there aren't others, but the last two of these are ones that I see attested in the literature, so I want to kind of um, hone in on those, but let me present three possibilities right now. So number one, um, this one given um, in 10, um, while it might be possible to formulate a constraint that ensured, for instance, that um, the, the, the second more be high tone in Chilungu in the recent past, or a rule that inserted it there, um, this seems suspicious, at least for Chilungu, as the tone appears to be a morphological exponent of inflectional properties on complete par with the segmental affixes that appear with it. So what would the evidence be to conclude that the segmental exponents of the segmental exponents of the inflectional category are introduced in the, in the morphology, but the melodic high is not? So I leave this open as a possibility where you would want to kind of, you know, insert and link all the tones, all the melodic tones completely in the phonology as a possibility. I, I haven't seen a lot of people explicitly assuming this, um, but we leave it, it's certainly a possibility, so it's on the table. But let me now go to two other possibilities that have been assumed by a number of analysts in the literature, and I'll spend the rest of the talk talking about those two. So the first one I'm calling the annotated tone hypothesis, okay? Um, and these are distinguishable melodic tones generated by the morphology that ultimately get docked in the phonology. So let's go back to our Chilungu case. So put aside the one that doesn't have a melodic high, we're not interested in that. Of the three ones that have a melodic um, high, we have the recent past, where remember it's going to dock onto the second, the potential, it's going to dock onto the final, and the future where it's the second um, through the final. Okay, so one possibility is that the 
the melodic tones that are generated in the morphosyntax are different from each other. They're all high tones, they're all floating high tones, but, 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 but they're different. And so the way that I have kind of characterized, I've shown that here is with subscripts. So I have an H sub I, an H sub J, and an H sub K. This is kind of the approach that I assumed in my monograph. I didn't, you know, kind of go into great detail on it. Um, but I just kind of assumed that the, the, the morphology could generate um, um, uh, multiple melodic high tones that were sort of annotated as to where they needed to get attached. Then, you know, if you then, um, um, so for instance, there will be a number of tense aspect mood polarities that, you know, assign as an exponent the H sub I, a number that assign the H sub J, and a number that, that assign the H sub K. Then when you get into the phonology, you basically just have three linking rules. You say all H sub I's linked to the second mora. If you're an H sub J, link to the final mora. And if you're an H sub K, link to the second through the final. So the pros here is that the phonological rules actually have no direct morphosyntactic conditioning at all. But the cons is that you're generating three different floating highs, which the rules have to be sensitive to. And I have a feeling, a little suspicion that as people look at this, it's a little bit cringy, right? It's like, you know, these subscripts are kind of making me nervous. All right, fair enough. Um, uh, um, there have been recent approaches basically that have done a much better job that go along with this, with this idea of um, having annotated tones, but do it in, in, a, much, in a much more interesting and, and, and clever and maybe defensible way. So one approach that I'd like to draw your attention to in this regard that I'll talk about today um, is the phantom structure approach that was advocated in Nick Rowley's 2018 dissertation. So how did Nick handle this stuff? Um, in addition to an underlying tamp consisting of any segmental exponents and a floating tone, it also contains, in his view, phantom structure. And this is a plane containing tone bearing units to which underlying floating highs can be indicated to be linked. Okay, so you're thinking, okay, this sounds a little bit squirrely. You know, I, I'm not imagining how it works. Let's look at an actual example then. So here in 16, we're going to look at an example of phantom structure from the Kikuria, the Kikuria inceptive. So in Kikuria, the way that you form the inceptive is that you, you slap on the prefix ra. So everything in white here is basically the, the underlying representation of the inceptive. So it's got a prefix ra and it's got a floating high. The thing is that floating high, just like in Chilungo, can't just be left to dock anywhere. Because if you just randomly dock it, in most cases, it'll, it'll produce an ungrammatical form. It needs to ultimately dock onto the fourth tone bearing unit of the stem. So yes, this is the famous Kikuria case that's gotten a lot of attention in the literature. You know, our, our phonological rules allowed to count and all this other stuff. But for our purposes today, this is the way that Rowley would handle the Kikuria inceptive is to say, yeah, it's the prefix raw, it's a floating tone, but we're gonna provide some phantom structure to show where we want it to be linked. Well, how is this gonna be used? Well, in, in, in an OT account, constraints will then ensure that the linkage in the underlying phantom structure structure, to the fourth more here, matches the linkage in the output structure. Okay, so of course, higher rank constraints could alter it a little bit. But in general, basically, this is the way that you would get the, the high linked to the fourth. So you can imagine an analogous account available for the three chilingo patterns very easily. You, you would basically have, you know, a floating tone, and sometimes you would want to dock it onto the second, and other times you would want to dock it onto the final um, more of the stem. And in other cases, you could dock it on from the second through the final. OK, so that then is a, a quick sketch of what I'm calling the annotated tones hypothesis, where the if you've got three or four or five or six different docking patterns in the language, you basically in the underlying structure of the tense aspect, or it's certainly in the morphology, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are the, 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 the high, the floating high tones are generated there, but you're also generating information as to how they need to be linked ultimately in the phonology. I did it in the olden days with the, you know, these subscripts in a more modern way, you could do it with a fan structure. Okay, that's the first hypothesis. I'm only going to do two. I'm only going to concentrate on two. So that's the first hypothesis. Second hypothesis is what I'm calling the single tone hypothesis. And that is there's the single melodic high tone generated by the morphology, and then it's docked in the phonology. 
So these should look familiar. Deja vu, right? We've just seen these, you know, um, a few minutes ago. But notice the subs the subscripts have, have have gone. So now what we're saying, and under this hypothesis, the underlying representations of the recent past potential and future forms look like this. No more subscripts. So yay, you cheer. Well, look, we didn't like the subscripts. Okay, that's fine. But this can't be the end of the story. Because if, if you just basically push this into the phonology without any other information, it's going to be chaos. You can't randomly dock these. They still have to dock on to just the right tone bearing units. Well, then we're going to say that there's three different docking rules in the phonology. And each of those three rules is going to have a long list of TAMP combos, which trigger those okay so in fact there's going to be four different temp combos that trigger the the, the, the mora two there's going to be a dozen that trigger the, the final mora and another dozen that trigger the second through the final so let's look for example how would this work in the potential like what's the rule that would dock in 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 the cases of verbs that need the 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 the, the melodic high docked onto the final what would the rule look like well this is what the rule would look like in 19. so part of it's pretty simple you've got a floating high links to the final more of the stem. That's great. But, but again, we don't want every floating high to link to the final more of the stem. Just the ones that have to link there. Well, which ones have to link there? This is going to have to be highly morphosyntactically conditioned. So the rule in the phonology is going to have the high link into the final, but it's going to say, but only do this in the far past, far recent, the, the, the past, far past progressive, remote future, remote perfect, the negative contrast of habitual, the negative persistent, blah, blah, blah. But you're going to have to mention all 12 things. And you're going to have to do that for the one that docks onto the second mora and the second through the final. Now, the alternative, which is, you know, maybe just um, a notational variant of what I just said. Sure, you could have four cophonologies. So you could have one for no melodic high, and then you could have one for each of the three melodic high patterns. But the cophonologies, each cophonology is going to have this long list of tamp combinations that trigger it. Okay, so in order then, so, so, so that then is a thumbnail sketch of the single tone hypothesis. So you get the distinction be, between the two. They're similar, but there's differences. In order to be able to kind of tease out kind of what the differences are there, we're, we're going to need to spend a little bit more time talking about the kinds of factors that, um, that, 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 that condition the melodic highs. What are the things that have an influence as to whether the melodic highs are present and how they dock? So, so far in Chilungo, I've given you tense aspect mood basically are the things that do that. But there's more factors um, 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 as, as well. So let me discuss two of them now. So one of them is gonna be polarity and the other one is gonna be the presence of an object marker. So let's go now to the forms in 23. This is the perfect tense in Chilungu, the affirmative perfect, oops, the affirmative perfect is on the left and the negative perfect is on the right. Okay, so what you can see basically is that in the perfect, you always have a melodic tone. But the problem is, if, if, it's, the, if it's the affirmative perfect, then you want the melodic high to dock onto the second through the final. Whereas if it's the negative perfect, you want the melodic high to dock only on the final vowel. And you'll have to trust me that this is not phonolog phonologically predictable. There's no sense in which Chilungu has a productive process. Oh, a floating high does this if there's two linked highs before it, but it does this if there's three linked highs before it. None of that will work. You basically just have to know whether the, the form is in the, um, is in the affirmative or the negative in order to know which of the docking patterns it, docking patterns it exhibits. The same thing is true with the presence of an object marker in the imperative. Now, in many tense aspect moods, it, the pattern doesn't care whether there's an object or not, in front, an object marker in front. The imperative does. So here's an instance of a high tone verb in the imperative to untie. We, we want to have a melodic high present in both the, the form without an, a, a, an object marker and with an object marker. But if it doesn't have an object marker, we want it to dock to the final. If it does have an object marker, we want it to dock onto the second through the final. And again, you know, there, this is not phonologically predictable. You basically, the, the, the rule that associates the melodic high to the tone bearing unit simply has to know what, what the tense aspect is, and in this case, whether there is an object marker or not. Okay, I'm going to give you a break from Chilungu for a few minutes, and then we're going to come back to it. So what I've done now in Chilungu is to talk about what some of the factors are that influence when the melodic high is generated and how it docks 
tense aspect mood, polarity, presence of object marker. What are the other things that are also um, an influence? So here we're going to widen our, our lens, super you know, wide angle, and move outside Chilungu. And what I'd like to draw on here is um, a 2014 special volume of Africana Linguistica that David Oden and I um, edited, um, where we invited authors to kind of describe um, melodic tone patterns in the language that they work on and the things that, how, how do you know, you know, which tone pattern is going to show up. Uh, we looked at over 28 languages from a dozen countries and a dozen different um, um, Bantu um, uh, zones. And so, so you may ask, what, what did you conclude here? Well, I can give you a brief summary. So what we found is that the tense aspect mood is always a factor. In other words, in every language, tense aspect mood is always a factor in how when and, and when the melodic high is going to be present and, and, and what pattern it's going to have. Polarity is extremely common. In fact, we only found one, only one of our languages um, um, uh, 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 had uh, polarity not being a factor at all. In, in other cases, it, it always was, at least in some tenses. A subordination and relativization are also factors. Now, interestingly, Chilungu is one of the four languages here in our, in our survey where it wasn't a factor, fine, but in most languages, subordination and relativization was a factor. Focus, um, as well as the conjoint disjoint distinction in some languages played a role. Um, the presence of an object marker, we've just been through that with Chilungu, but many other languages had object markers also um, being a factor. Subject marker, also true for Chilungu, we're going to come back to that at the very end of the talk. So different subject markers um, could also trigger um, um, different patterns. Uh, the presence of the reflexive prefix, indications of motions, the presence of verbal extensions. All of these then were factors that bore on um, uh, what whether the melodic high would be there, melodic tones, I should say, because some languages have lows as well, um, and how they were going to, um, to dock. But if you take a look at this, all everything that I've, I've given you here, this is all morphosyntactic stuff. This is all inflectional stuff. So we come to an interesting question in 30 six are there phonological factors that which um, uh, are there phonological factors which which influence melodic tone realization now they certainly play a role in determining how melodic tones are ultimately realized but do they play a role in directly determining their very presence as well, or their primary docking pattern and the answer to this is yes phonological factors factors are also going to be involved so we return here I told you it wouldn't be too long we return here to chilungu so now we're going to take a look at the perfect forms. Probably of all the tense aspects for Chilungu, the perfect is the most complicated. Why? Um, the perfect always will have a melodic high in the form, but it, but, but it's not consistent in its docking pattern. So some perfect forms show, exhibit the pattern where the melodic high needs to dock onto the second tone bearing unit. Other perfect forms, it's the final tone bear, it's the final um, 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 mora of the stem. And in other perfect forms, it's the second through the final. So in some tense aspect moods in Chilungo, like, 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 the, like the distant perfect, it, it takes them a lot of chi in every perfect form, negative, you know, affirmative, object, no object, takes the same pattern. And the perfect is interesting in that there's three different patterns. Well, you may ask, you know, what determines, you know, the pattern? Okay, it's kind of complicated. So I've made a little chart for us here, which summarizes uh, the Chilungu perfect. So here's what you have to know in order to be able to determine how the melodic tone high is going to dock in the Chilungu perfect. You need to know whether the verb is affirmative or negative. We already actually saw some perfect forms that illustrated that. Um, you need to know whether the root is toneless or root is high. So there we got phonology entering in. And you need to know whether the subject marker is toneless or the subject marker is high. OK, so you've got to know all three of those things in order to be able to predict the pattern. So now we ask the question, given this complication, how how would this work in the two different hypotheses that I'm talking about today? So let's first go to the annotated tone hypothesis. So the morphosyntax basically is going to consider both morphological, that's in, in morphosyntactic properties, you know, that's in, in green, as well as phonological properties, that's in red, in order to be able to determine whether you get assigned, the, the, the melodic high gets assigned to the second mora, or the final mora, or the second through the final mora. So you could do these with the with the with the um, 
uh, subscripts if you wanted, or a more, more modern framework, you could do it with um, uh, 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 the fandom structure. Um, but these are going to be high tones that are distinguished from each other in the morphosyntax on the basis of both inflectional as well as phonological factors. Then in the phonology, you just have the, 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 the linking rules sensitive to the annotations. Okay, what about the single tone hypothesis? Well, the single tone hypothesis is different, actually. The morphosyntax could be very different. So the single tone hypothesis could just say, you know what? The perfect simply generates a floating high. That's it. Remember, that's the difference between these two. So you just generate a floating high, and then it's the phonology that does all the work. So in the phonology, you are going to have these three different cophonologies triggered by both morphological, morphosyntactic, as well as phonological um, considerations, okay? So as we contrast these, the single tone hypothesis, I want to note actually is duplicative in the sense that the specification of the TAM is gonna to need to occur both in the morphology, because not all TAMs get a melodic high, as well as the phonology, because you've got to kind of you know, know what TAMs and, um, um, and, and, and the polarity and whatnot in order to be able to know the pattern. Whereas this is not the case in the annotated tone hypothesis. But in the single tone hypothesis, for Chilungu anyway, note that we avoid any phonological conditioning in the morphology, right? So in the annotated tone hypothesis, the morphosyntax has to know morphological and phonological information, okay, but the phonology doesn't really need to know either. Um, the, in the single tone hypothesis, you have the, 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 the morphology needs to know just the, more, just the inflectional information and the inflectional and phonological information determining the pattern doesn't come into play until the until the, uh, the phonology. So here's the question. As we look at a wider range of languages, okay, because the, there's more to Bantu than just Chilungu, I'll be the first one to admit that. As we look at a wider array of languages, is it the case that the single tone hypothesis can avoid reference to phonological structure in the morphosyntax where the melodic tone is generated? Or are there cases where the morphosyntax necessitates phonological information just to correctly generate a melodic tone in the input? If so, then the single tone hypothesis, like the annotated tone hypothesis, would sometimes need to access phonological information. So let's take a look at, at a few different languages to see if we can kind of um, look at this question. Um, are there going to be cases where um, e even under the single tone hypothesis that you're going to need phonological information as well as syntactic information, morphosyntactic information, just to generate the melodic tone? Okay, let me go first to Runyan Kore. So I'm presenting some data here that I, I, I got um, from uh, Larry Hyman. I, you know, he may have published this in, in different places, but um, I took it from um, a, 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 a kind of a big grid that he sent me. So in um, Runyang Kore, um, you have a difference between toneless verbs and high tone verbs. And there are some verb forms just like Chilungu where there isn't a melodic high. So these are the simple cases. You can see that these this turns out all low and the high tone verb turns out it has a high tone there, nothing else happens, so fine. But in the, in the relative clauses involving these forms, it's different. So if you take a look at the same toneless root, all of a sudden here, we have a high tone on the second tone bearing unit. Okay, so that's the melodic high. And if you take a look at the high tone root, you have the high tone root here, but you don't seem to have any melodic high. So must we say that the, ver the very generation of a melodic high in Runyon Kore is sensitive to the phonological structure of the verb? Well, maybe not. Why? Um, here are the underlying possible underlying representations for these forms in 46. Definitely, we need a melodic high here to link from to link onto the second tone bearing unit of the, of the stem. But what about here? Do, do Analysis one would be to say, well, don't even generate the melodic high there. Analysis two would be to say, yeah, go ahead and generate the melodic high in both cases. But in the case of 48b, we can just have a rule that deletes the melodic high. And in fact, it's a very well-known rule called Mayusin's rule that says in, in certain instances where you have two highs within the same domain, most very commonly the stem, go ahead and delete one of them. So we can, I'm just saying for, for, for Runyon Kore, we don't have to 
to say that the very generation of a melodic high is sensitive to the tonal structure of, of the root. Go ahead, put a melodic high in all of these um, relative forms. And then we have a rule that says, oh, if there's two within a stem, delete the second one. That gets rid of that one. That explains it. This one is going to link to the to the second one. The same thing is true um, in Lega imperative. So Mayusin kind of discusses these. Um, it's very similar to the Runyon Kore, toneless roots, high tone roots. Um, if for, for low tone, for, for toneless roots, the melodic high docks onto the second through the final, but in high tone roots, the melodic high isn't seen. Well, here again, we could assume that the melodic high is present in both forms, but just deletes in this case. Why? Because there's two within the same domain, the second one, Deletes. So these are cases on it on their surface that you might where you might think, hmm, maybe the very generation of melodic high depends upon some phonological aspect of, of the of the form, but in reality, you don't need to do that. Okay. Can, can you get away with that in all cases? And what I'd like to do now is to present some problematic cases for saying that the morphology can generate these melodic highs um, and determine the pattern without any recourse to the phonology. So I'd like to present some new data from uh, Lala, and then I'm gonna present some data that's very much like it that already existed in the literature. So Lala is a Zambian Bantu language that has the same set of melodic high patterns found in Chilungu. So now that you're all kind of Chilungu experts with this in your short-term memory, it's got, you know, sometimes there's no melodic high, sometimes it's on the second mora, sometimes it's on the final mora, sometimes it's on the second through the final. Now, for the Chilungu data presented thus far, we noted that some TAMs never had any melodic high, and others always did, even though an individual TAM could exhibit multiple docking patterns. While this is generally true in Lala, it's not always so. So in the perfect, and it's a little bit different perfect because it's got this Lee prefix, but it's the perfect in Lala. In the perfect verbs with tone, in the perfect, verbs with toneless roots have no melodic high, where those with high tone roots have a melodic high that docks onto the second mora through the final. So here are the underlying presentations. This is the, your, 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 your toneless root here. And as you take a look here, this is pronounced all low. So there aren't, there's no melodic high that's been added here. Here is a high toned root, but you need to add a melodic high in order to get the highs from the second through the final. So if you take a look at the underlying representations in this time, this case, we absolutely need the melodic high in 57B right, because we need it to dock under the second through the final. Now, there isn't any high that ends up docking in 57A. So do we generate the melodic, do we generate the high there or not? Okay, so if the, morph if the morpho syntax generates melodic highs purely on inflectional factors without any recourse to the phonological properties of the form, then I think you agree that either both of these forms have a melodic, melodic high or neither does. If neither have a melodic high, then some rule or constraint in the phonology is going to insert a high tone and link it onto the second through the final, just in the event that there's a stem initial high. This would not only be the only high insertion rule in the language, as all other melodic highs are, are, are present due to, due to being inserted um, in the morphosyntax, but such a process is obviously a strange, highly marked phonological rule as it flagrantly violates the OCP. If the melodic high is generated in the morphosyntax for both forms, something that we did above for Runyon Kore and Lega, then the cophonology it triggers would link the high to the melodic high to the second more through the final, but the melodic high would be deleted or left unassociated just in the event that it was preceded by a toneless mora. Once again, a strange phonological rule. So just to recap here, if we do it this way and say that there's melodic high in both cases, what the rule says is, oh, if you can cause a flagrant OCP violation, go ahead and do that, but otherwise don't do it. So don't link it with all this room here, but go ahead and link it only if it's going to cause an OCP violation. Of course, you can write a rule to do that. I'm not saying that you can't, but that is, that's a, a, a phonological rule that might make some people uncomfortable. Um, the very similar thing happens in Tura which is a Kenyan Luya language described by Marlowe 2008. It has melodic high patterns accounted for by two docking rules. One, in some cases you dock to the stem initial syllable, in other cases to the stem final mora. Uh, 
Okay. Um, and they're uh, crucially in Torah, it's one of the Luya languages where there's no contrast at all in, in no tone contrast in, in, in verbal roots. Okay. So what we're interested in Torah is Marlowe's pattern for C. So here, you, again, all the roots are toneless. Here you can see that a melodic high shows up and here it doesn't. Okay. And the correlation is the melodic high shows up only with, with a high toned um, when, when, the, when, 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 when the syllable, the pre-stem syllable is high, but not when the pre-stem syllable is toneless. So in Marlowe's analysis of this pattern, the melodic high docks onto the first syllable of the stem and then shifts to the following syllable because of the syllable, because of the length of the stem, but only docks and shifts if the pre-stem tone bearing unit is high. If it is toneless, then the melodic high fails to dock. So it's the same situation as in um, Lala. You have melodic highs here, and you want to. You're thinking you, they need to dock onto the first tone bearing unit of the stem. Only do it if it causes an OCP violation. Otherwise, don't do it. Okay. So you can write the rule, but it's strange. Strange. So Marlowe assumes the phonology generates a melodic high for all negative imperative forms. Okay. Um, um, uh, let's see. Um, Yes, um, and the phonological rule which links that melodic high in that TAM does so only if the pre-stem tone bearing unit um, is high toned, a typologically unusual rule similar to the one that we'd need for Lala. Now, so, so I just wanted to be clear, of course you can write that rule, only dock the melodic high that's gonna you know, cause an OCP violation, you know, only if that, the, that previous syllable is, is high toned. But, but on the table also is the alternative, which would be to have the morphological process that generates the melodic high in the first place simply be sensitive to the phonological structure of the word. So an alternative, okay, in Torah would be to say that in the, 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 um, uh, uh, the negative imperative only um, generate the melodic high for high tone roots. Um, Ligori um, is a Kenyan uh, Luya language um, described by um, um, Odin. Um, it, and it basically does a very similar thing. It exhibits um, melodic highs on uh, either the first syllable, the second syllable, the second more of the stem, the second more after the initial syllable, um, and the final more. Okay, so all, what we're interested in looking at, again, are these imperatives. So here, there is a distinction between high and toneless. This is a high tone root, and this is um, 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 a, a toneless one. And basically, you are inserting the melodic high um, in the more two through final pattern only on the high tone roots not on the toneless one. So Odin analyzes forms such as 67A with high tone roots as having a melodic high assigned to the final mora and spreading leftward to the second mora, um, ultimately um, uh, inducing deletion of the root high. For imperatives such as 67B, he simply states that tones, uh, toneless verbs on the other hand do not have a high tone. So it's not clear to me in Odin's analysis if he's saying don't generate the high if um, the, the root is toneless or it, like Marlowe more specifically says, yes, go ahead and generate it, but only link it if it's, if, if it's high. So the choice here is to either have the generation of the melodic high by the morphology be sensitive to the morphological structure of the form and not be generated in 67B or to have a phonological process that deletes or fails to link a melodic high just in case the root initial tone bearing unit is toneless. So it's again, very similar to Tura and Lala. And Tachoni is just another example where the exact same thing happens. I won't, for, for, I see where we're, 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 we're getting near on the time. It's basically exactly the same um, as the Ligori case where you're, you're not assigning melodic high in a toneless root, but you are doing it in a, in a high tone root. Okay, so now we, we, we conclude with one last fact, an interesting fact about Chilungu that I think bears on this question. So in tense aspect moods that have the prefix high toned ah, and um, in, in two of the ones um, where, and in two that have a uh, high toned ah followed by high toned chi, these are kind of recent past forms. One generally finds the melodic high on the final vowel. Okay, so here are a bunch of forms. Here's the underlying representations here. Here are the service representations. In every case, this, this looks like, oh, it's one of those tenses where you just put the melodic high in the final vowel with an interesting proviso. If the subject marker is toneless, and that happens in three of the 18 class prefixes, uh, subject markers, so class one, four, and nine, if it's one of those three, then no melodic high is realized on the final vowel or anywhere else. So here we have 
more uh, forms with the with the high tone recent past forms with the ah prefix. But but since the subject markers are toneless instead of being high toned, you don't you don't um, uh, uh, no melodic high is realized on the final vowel or anywhere else. So here I give you the underlying representations for 71D and 72D. So here, if you're going to say um, that you definitely want a melodic high that has to surface on the final vowel here, but what about B? Do we want to say that there is a, a, um, um, uh, a melodic high assigned here and then not to link it, just if what? The, the subject marker, which, you know, is kind of intervenes, two high tones intervene here, is toneless. Well, Rowley and Bickmore, in an article that we have forthcoming in morphology, we argue that this should actually be treated in the morpho syntax as lexically conditioned allomorphy and not within the phonology as a morphological um, prop. Uh, a process. So in other words, we're advocating, no, don't even generate um, uh, that, 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 that we're not going to generate um, a melodic high here um, at all in this form. So if this is correct, it would be further evidence that it may not be possible to make the generation of melodic tones completely blind to phonological structure. Okay, P appreciate people's patience here. We're now at the conclusion. So to conclude, today we've talked about the melodic high and Bantu. I kind of zeroed in on two possible hypotheses that we could consider in terms of a formal kind of explanation of how this all works, the annotated tone hypothesis and the single tone hypothesis. The annotated tone hypothesis, the generation of melodic tones in the morphosyntax must consider a range of inflectional properties of the verb and will definitely have to consider phonological properties of the form as well. Then the phonology generally need not access morphosyntactic information, but simply docks the tones according to the specific specified annotation. So for instance, the, the phantom structure. The single tone hypothesis, the, the generation of the melodic tones and the morpho syntax, in many, many cases seems to be largely phonology free. But in order for it to be completely free of phonology, phonological considerations, the trade-off, in some languages at least, is the presence of linking or deletion rules in the phonology which are typologically strange, running, for instance, counter to normal OCP ex expectations or long distance reference to the tonal status of a particular prefix, which is what we saw at the end in Chilungu. Um, but the, the phonology actually will, requ will require, and then turning to the phonology, it will require access to both inflectional information, some of which is duplicative in which was required by the morphosyntax, as well as the phonological information. Okay, thank you for your attention uh, to the talk. That's it. Thank you. Uh, wow. We learned a lot about melodic high today. So <laughs> it's, it's great. And it's also good to uh, have been introduced to the new, uh, relatively recent work. Uh, yeah on melodic high. So uh, do we have any questions uh, from Ro? Feel free to unmute yourself and yes, Laura. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, it's like a talk all day about uh, melodic <laughs> So I do have some questions. I'll try to, to focus and make them, you know, straightforward. Um, yeah, so I was trying to relate your two different proposals to the kind of um, framework that I've been intrigued by, which is trying to formalize melodic tone, well, and link it to the rest of the morphology that goes together with the morphemes that uh, are associated with melodic tone and I guess what you would call a word and paradigm kind of framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had trouble seeing which one of these. I mean, it's, I think in this framework, I, I guess what I really appreciated about your talk is that you emphasize that both morphological or morphosyntactic factors and phonological factors have to be involved in conditioning the, the presence and realization of the melodic tones. And that's what the word and paradigm does. But then I had trouble thinking of it as either a single tone or or annotated tone. 
Lori, yeah, I'd like to, uh, you know, I know just 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 a little tiny bit about it. I mean, maybe, you know, you could email me, you know, um, any work, that, you know, work that you've done or or some kind of a, of, a, of a primer on the word and paradigm, because, yeah, maybe that's a next step for me is to take a look at some of the frameworks that people are using to see if it kind if if what I'm saying here kind of fits with it or if it's more ortho orthogonal, you know, um, or not. But I guess. You know, yeah, I um, think um, my analysis of Chichewa would be like what you've got in 41, which is showing here that you have in the morphosyntax um, a set of morphosyntactic properties, but also, I guess, lexical tonal properties. For me, I, yeah, I go back and forth and trying to decide whether those are morphological or phonological. But anyway, yeah, where, where you have to have a paradigm defined by all of the properties that you have here. Yeah, and then what I'm playing around with, I think because mostly because I'm sort of um, building on, but critiquing Sharon Inkless's approach to Chichewa, that she does something like this and then links these properties to a cophonology that would, I guess, if you align a high tone and a cophonology, you're both introducing a high a high tone and then placing it somewhere in a single constraint. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, that it's his yeah. annotated tones that I'm, yeah, sort of working on a variant of, of this. Yeah, yeah this so is, sorry, I guess this isn't a question. I'm just trying yeah, no, to no, no, that. yes. And to be honest with you, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, your, your, your 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 monograph and 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 you know Chichewa is is maybe going to be one of the toughest cases. I mean maybe that's it's a good case to look at because there's so many factors that, that are involved. It really stretches kind of you know the grammar. So I would take me more time to kind of see if if one could actually just get Chichewa, just get the right results in either one of these you know, hypotheses, or if, if, if really one of them just, if Chichewa breaks one of them and, and the other one would be the one that, that you would have to adopt, because it's really, um, it's really complex. Yeah, well, like I said, I think uh, that, yeah, the annotated tones hypothesis, I mean, your, your phonology, you're just linking real sensitive to annotations. To me, this is a notational variant of saying you're assuming cophonologies that are specific to each of okay. your cases, A, B, and C. So, well, anyway, so interesting. Right. Um, okay. So maybe I should let someone ask if there's anyone else with a question, because I think I... Sure. Yeah, sure. We can come back if you have more. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have a, a question? Hmm. Actually, let me uh, let me ask a question that might the students might have asked <laughs> the question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so this melodic high happens in uh, multiple uh, syntactic constructions, morphosyntactic constructions, and the list uh, where at some point you uh, presented like, oh, these things have this pattern, these things have this pattern, uh, these mor uh, morphosyntactics. Uh, in do you do you find any like uh, semantic similarity of these constructions or have you ever uh, uh, thought about those uh, issues uh, can be one thing that uh, that that might come into some uh, some some <laughs> some people's mind uh, yes. I, I i kind of guess the answer but like i i just want to right. uh, be a yeah, little bit right. formative yeah and right. Okay, so let me. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take yeah. a stab at that, and then yeah, Laura may want to kind of add to it too. Right. Yeah, so I think the answer, sadly, is no for mm -hmm. for most cases. Certainly for Chilungu. So, for instance, if you take a look, so I, if I'm, 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 I'm I, sorry, it took me so long. So, um, for the for the for the for the pattern where you dock under the second mora, there's four different tamp combos there. For the final Mora, it, there's 12 different tamp combos. And then for the second through the final, there's 12. There's no way to make semantic sense out of any of those. Th there might be some sub-regularities. So for instance, you know, it might be that you don't find any past tenses maybe in one of those three categories, but the past tenses that you do find are going to be kind of, you know, divided. Well, I don't know what other, you know, semantic, 
you know, um, considerations that, you know, you might, you might be thinking of, but it's going to be, you know, maybe at, at the beginning, there was some semblance, you know, of this, but I think now synchronically in most Bantu languages, um, when you're taking a look at all of the forms that have one pattern and all the forms that have another and all the forms that have another, there isn't any interesting coherent semantic generalization that you can say, oh, all, all the verbs in this pattern have this in common semantically versus this versus this, at least for Chilungu, it absolutely doesn't work. Yes, yes, that, that, that was my guess, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, now people have it uh, on the record that actually right, yeah. not really, uh, it can be uh, thought in terms of semantics. Uh, the other thing is just out of curiosity, have you ever uh, thought about uh, the potential uh, prosodic effect uh, like, uh, like now it's mostly uh, focusing on the morphosyntactic structure and the tone, yeah. but uh, uh, can these different TAMP combos, let's say, be marked on uh, generating different prosodic structure, let's say, tonal span, and that's why uh, they, maybe it's the same story in a different, from a different angle, uh, uh, it might end up being like that, but. Well, let me, uh, I'll provide a small answer to it. And then, you yeah. know, Laura can jump in. She may know other cases. So for instance, um, in Chilungu, I think that the spans that these things operate in, it, it really is, is, you know, the, in general, it's kind of the, this morphological stem. Now in, in um, Chitonga, Malawi and Chitonga, Right. Um, we found that there you could kind of um, diagnose a prosodic stem where these melodic highs, you know, had their um, uh, domain, and it included the morphological stem plus a range of of you know kind of um, um, enclitics, okay, um, that come at the end, okay? So it's not always just through the final vowel, for instance, that you get the demarcation of the domain of like, like when I say, you know, assign it to the, to the, to, to, to the second mora or assign it to the final mora. Well, second and final mora of what? Here in Chilungu, it, you can pretty much use the morphological stem to try, kind of make it all work out. But at least in, in, in that language, there were other things to the right of the stem, other clinics to the right that also um, were part of the domain because if they were present, they would get the high tone rather than the final vowel say. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but there definitely are some interesting kind of prosodic, you know, kind of conclusions that you can draw by looking at the docking of of melodic tones. Yeah, thank you, thank you. L Laura, do you, uh, does anyone have a, a question or like? It seems like people are taking it in. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I know, uh, right. Yeah, yeah especially. That's why I had those yeah, yeah, that's why I had those quote, quotes at the beginning, because it's so grueling and tough and, a, and it just, you know, hurts your head to kind of, you know, do all these tones. But Larry and, and, and David and Chuck promise us that the rewards will be big if we stick to it. So we try. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So just to follow up to Lee's comment yeah. about the domain of realization, I guess maybe this is something else that's different about Chicheva is that the stem... I mean, there's one pattern, a high tone is either on the final or the penultimate within the stem, but then also what's Myers called the auxiliary stem, like the, mm -hmm. yeah, the string of prefixes before the stem is also a domain of realization of melodic high tone in, in Chicheva. So in Chicheva, you have to look at the whole word and tones are okay. positioned with respect pretty much the entire verb word. Yeah, so that was, yeah, that is yeah. different. Right. Yeah. And in certain cases, you know, for Chilungu, the, where you get the second mora or, you know, whatever is, is the stem, but there's a lot of Bantu languages where it's calculated on the macro stem, where you would start with the object markers. You don't in, in, in Chilungu, but in a number of languages you do. So yeah, Laura's right. The, the, the domain that you need to set up to talk about where, you know, do, you know, what does it mean to say the first syllable or the second syllable or the third more or whatever 
can be somewhat different from, from language to language. So Chilungo represents maybe a cleanish case where it's the morphological stem. There are other cases where you, you, you do want to have the object marker part of it. And then Laura, and I'm suggesting for, for Tonga, you also want to have some, 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 some clinics afterwards part of it. And then Laura suggested that some analyses of Chichewa would want to say, no, it's, it's basically the whole verb because even the pre macro stem material is thought of in, 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 in melodic terms. So there's, there's a number of different possibilities. It's complicated stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is, uh, but it's also intriguing for us uh, yeah, to right. uh, yeah. uh, tackle this issue. I think uh, uh, we we have a little bit more time for discussion, but I will officially wrap up and then we can continue the discussion a little bit. So uh, let me thank the two co-organizers, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and Professor Yoko Mizuta the assistants, uh, Paris Fleming, Shigeto Kamano, as well as the Liaison IRS Institute of System Missionary Suzuki. This event was supported by the shared budget of ICU Research Institute, Institute of e Educational Research and Service, and the Linguistic Lab at ICU. Uh, the next ICU Linguistic Colloquium on African Linguistics will be held on January 29th. Uh, Dr. Jochen Zeller from University of KwaZulu-Natal and Cedric Patin from University of Lille uh, will share their research. Uh, however, uh, the time will be different uh, from uh, the usual uh, case uh, because uh, we are usually meeting at 10 a.m. on Japan time, but uh, due to, that's 2 a.m. in Europe or South Africa. So we are going to have it at 5 p.m. We will start from 5 p.m. Uh, Tokyo oh, time. So, so 5 p.m. Japan time. Japan time. So unfortunately for the U.S., it would be uh, too early in the morning. Uh, oh, no. uh, yeah, but uh, we are going to record it, uh, okay. so uh, so we will share the handouts as well. So for the European talks, uh, it's it was like uh, yeah, that's basically no. what uh, uh, we uh, decided to do. Uh, unfortunately, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, that's uh, that concludes uh, today's uh, uh, colloquium. Uh, please uh, stop the recording now.